What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We're getting into my bold predictions today. My top three boldy, 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 bold predictions for the 2018 fantasy football season. A video backed by popular demand. So now that I've, that I've waited until August, I feel like these bold predictions need to be really, 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 really bold. I mean, that's what makes them fun, right? They're very unlikely to happen, but, but they're fun to talk about. They're fun to talk about in theory. However, these three bold predictions are are three bold predictions that I would actually put money on if they had, as long as they were decent odds in Vegas. So I actually believe with uh, a decent percent chance that these things can actually come to fruition. A lot of you guys, when I ask you what your bold predictions are, I want you to actually drop down below what your bold predictions are for the year because I love hearing other people's predictions. But a lot of you guys will be like, yeah, like player X or player Y is going to catch 24 touchdown passes, but with like literally no logic behind it. So I try to keep these as logical as possible and back them up with big facts only, with a bunch of stats and as best as I could do that for you guys. So that's what we have today. Again, though, before we start, I want to hear your bold prediction. So drop a comment down below. Drop a drop below, girl. Drop below, girl. What you have in store for your bold predictions, 2018 fantasy football season before we dive in. Let's get it. So bold prediction number one, Sammy Watkins finishes with the most fantasy points of any player on the Kansas City Chiefs in 2018. Ahead of Kelsey, ahead of Tyreek Hill, and yes, ahead of Kareem the Dream, Hunt. Sammy Watkins, skill player number one on the Kansas City Chiefs loaded offense. And I think this is very bold. A lot of people like Watkins, but this bold prediction is bold considering all three of those guys are getting picked 45 picks ahead of Watkins at least, right? Hunt is number 10 overall, Kelsey's 24, and Hill is 28 right now according to current ADP in the fantasy football community. I've already voiced my concern pretty heavily about Hunt and Hill this year, about why I'm avoiding them pretty much. So I don't want to go too deep into it, but to reiterate quickly, right, from what I said in my Kareem Hunt versus Dalvin Cook in the Muck Monday video, Kareem Hunt saw a little bit below 90% of the Chiefs carries in 2017. Just under 90% of their running back carries, guys. And that's a number by far and away above the typical carry split we've seen under Andy Reid. The RB2 in an Andy Reid offense, well, at least for the Chiefs so far, has seen between 20 and 35% of the running back carries in that offense. Last year, that number was 6%. The RB2 saw 6% of the running back carries in Kansas City. The reason was obvious. It was because Spencer Ware tore all his stuff up in his knees, LCL, his PCL, in the summer, leaving the door wide open for Hunt to take almost all of the work. All they had behind him was Chark Andrick West, who's more of like a gadget third down guy than someone you can trust with a high volume of carries. Um, now, Hunt is very good, don't get me wrong, but my, my concern is with Reed. My concern is that he will not get anywhere near the amount of carries that he saw in the Chiefs' offense last year. My other concern is that Ware uh, weighs almost 230 pounds, so he's got about 15, 17 pounds on Kareem Hunt. Uh, goal line carries, Hunt only saw six goal line carries last year. Spencer Ware, the year prior to that, saw nine goal line carries despite playing in two fewer games than Hunt played in last year. So. We saw that he wanted to use Ware on the goal line more than he wanted to use Hunt last year. So you're taking away carries from Hunt because we've seen historically the RB2 get a lot more carries than they did last year in a read offense. Plus, you're, you're adding Ware back into the mix who has a lot of size on Hunt, and we've seen that Andy Reid wants to use him on the goal line. So I'm nervous he's not going to get the goal line carries, and I'm nervous he's not going to get the overall amount of volume he saw last year. So that is my concern for Hunt. Travis Kelsey, Kelsey is probably the most likely to repeat his numbers from 2017 into 2018, uh, but he's the least likely of the three to actually challenge Sammy Watkins for fantasy points, the fantasy points crown in uh, 2018. That's because, Kel I mean, tight ends overall, Kelsey's super valuable for a tight end in fantasy football, but overall, con con um, in, in retrospect to wide receivers and running backs, tight ends don't put up near the same amount of fantasy points. So he might repeat what he did and be just as valuable, but that valuable, that value doesn't always equate into actual fantasy points being um, on, on, on par with each other. So that's why I'm not really worried about Travis Kelsey. Tyreek Hill uh, is an easy fade for me 
as a wide receiver one where he's being picked right now in 2018 fantasy football. Amazing real life player, but Hill's efficiency last year was absolutely ridiculous, super high, while uh, Alex Smith's also was. It was a complete outlier year for Alex Smith. He ranked sixth in deep ball attempts and first in deep ball percentage um, or accuracy percentage, deep ball completion percentage. A number that, you know, it might be Hill's doing. It's more of like a chicken or the egg thing. But the, the overall point to take away here is that Alex Smith's overall numbers at the end were so efficient that Patrick Mahomes would have to play out of his mind just to keep up with Alex Smith last year. And if he did that, which is very unlikely, then Hill has to also play up to that efficiency level that he did last year. So you need two things to break right. And now you're just adding Sammy Watkins into the mix. So that makes it even harder for Hill to hit that. So I just say there's no way that um, Hill keeps up those numbers that he did last year. So what's good with Watkins, right? He was slapped with the injury prone label early in his career due to foot problems, lower leg problems. And, you know, it, it seemed like it was warranted at the time. But Watkins is coming off a um, an injury free no setbacks in his 15 games for the LA Rams. He sat out the last game because they were resting their starters. Watkins leaves LA via free agency, signs a fat contract with the Kansas City Chiefs, the biggest contract of all free agent wide receivers to the tune of three years, 48 million. You have to love it when a play caller, an offensive mind like Andy Reid goes out and handpicks a guy to play in his offense and gives him that type of money. Because that tells you, if he thinks he's worth that, that much money, he's going to use him to that worth and use him in that capacity. Um, what we're hearing from camp uh, uh, about Sammy Watkins is all positive, that he is working really hard. They're gaining a real, real rapport. And I'm going to um, list off some of the quotes that we're hearing so far. Chiefs.com, BJ Kissel writes, The connection between Patrick Mahomes and Sammy Watkins is real. Mahomes and Watkins have consistently been connecting throughout the offseason program. And fellow receiver Chris Conley said, Watkins has picked up the offense as fast as anyone I've seen. You're obviously going to hear a lot of reports like this in the offseason, but it's better to hear them like this than to hear the opposite about he's not up to speed or he needs to be in better shape or whatever. Or there's not really a real rapport there between the quarterback and the wide receiver. The other thing I would say with Watkins is he was traded to the Rams in the middle of the summer last year, or in mid-August. So he had like no time. He had just a few weeks to learn the Rams offense, get equated and gain chemistry and a connection with Jared Goff. And that obviously made an impact on how he played for the year. He still finished with eight touchdowns on just 66 targets. Coach Andy Reid said he's been moving Sammy Watkins all over the place on this offense. We were moving him everywhere, quote unquote, quote unquote. he hasn't had to do that in his career. Per Roto World, in past stops with the Bills and the Rams, Watkins has been a traditional X receiver on the backside of defenses routinely facing the other team's best corner or seeing double coverage. I don't know if you guys follow me on Twitter, but I retweeted a clip from training camp already in KC where Watkins is running a route over the post over the middle and makes an incredible one-handed catch. It looked beautiful. Um, but again, this is a week prior than this video is actually being released that I'm filming this. So a lot can happen between now and then. We'll probably hear more reports, but just letting you know I got it out before then. Anyways, yeah, he's, he's moving around a lot. He's not just going to be the traditional X receiver, but he is going to be the possession receiver there. I absolutely love this. Anytime you're moving a receiver around in an offense and having him learn all the positions, that gives you the opportunity to hide his weaknesses, right? If he has trouble maybe getting off press or man coverage, he doesn't have to run from the X slot. He could also move into the slot where it's very easy to gain separation from the cornerback and find the zones in the holes and stuff. So if he could play outside like, he's, like we've seen him do, then he is going to be a monster both inside and outside moving around the offense. I absolutely love that. Now, Watkins was a former top five pick back in 2014, right? Coming out of Clemson. He just missed that 1,000-yard mark during his rookie season. He scored six touchdowns, right under 1,000 yards, six touchdowns. That's a really, really, really good rookie campaign for any rookie that's came out over the last five years, right? 1,000 yards, six touchdowns. In 2015, he was only able to play in 13 games, but he managed to catch 60 balls, for 1,047 yards and nine touchdowns. If you pace that out to 16 games, you're looking at 74 catches, just under 1,300 yards and 11 touchdowns. He would finish that year going for over 80 yards in all six of their final games. Four of those six, he went for over 100 yards as well. And he scored six touchdowns in those final six games. Because he was an absolute monster to end the 2016 season before, you know, the 2017 season absolutely ruined things for people. I know I was one of those guys. I drafted Watkins, I think, in the third round of the 2017 or the 2016 drafts. Super high on him. All reports said that he was clear. And then all of a sudden, like week two, they were like, oh, the foot is acting back up again. Need to have surgery. And he would come back. And he, I don't know, he ended up missing eight games in the 2006 season. 
2016 season, but he was a monster in that 2015 season. Then I said, uh, then as I said, he was traded to LA last year, had little time to develop. Um, you could just see from some of the other numbers that he still was very good last year. Watkins ranked fifth in the NFL last year in QB rating when targeted, eighth in production premium, and 11th in target premium per player profiler. Really what I'm getting at is I didn't see any reason to believe that Watkins' top five talents have gone anywhere. He's just been in unlucky situations, unlucky injury history, um, you know, moving camps midway through the summer. It's a lot working against him. And now he has this full season, this full offseason to prepare with this new quarterback in this new offense with an offensive mind like Andy Reid. He's just 25 years old, guys, and he was a top five pick. You have to remember that we've heard so much about Watkins in the last few years, but he's still only 25 years old. He is a deep threat, a legitimate deep threat, along with a possession receiver. 4-4-3 speed, which puts him in the 90th percentile for weight adjusted speed score, considering his size. He's a he's a bigger player too. Not huge, but he's you know the weight adjusted speed score is great for a 4-4-3 speed given his size. He will still play the possession role, um, but see plenty of opportunities downfield. As I mentioned last year, Alex Smith in this offense threw the sixth most deep balls in 2017. Jared Goff ranked 20th in the NFL among quarterbacks in deep ball throws. Last year, nine of 39 receptions went for 20 plus yards for Watkins. And back in that breakout 2015 season, Watkins ranked second in the NFL in yards per target, sixth in yards per reception, and his average depth of target was second highest in the NFL. So he was a legitimate, awesome, elite deep threat in 2015. Got hurt in 2016, and then last year, in 2017, he wasn't used as much, but still, 9 of 39 receptions went for 20-plus yards. Now you're pairing him in an offense that throws the ball deep a lot, especially with Mahomes coming in. He's going to be getting a ton of deep throws, man, and I'm excited to see it. So the other thing is the, the Chiefs need uh, another target near the end zone outside of Kelsey. You don't really have that in Tyreek Hill. You don't have that um, in any other receiver there. So last year, Watkins, listen to this. Watkins saw 10 red zone targets last year, 10 targets inside the 20-yard line of his opponents. He converted seven of them into touchdowns. He had uh, five targets inside the 10 zone, right? He was like, he was Goff's go-to guy on slants and, and at the line of scrimmage passes. He converted four of five 10 zone targets into touchdowns, where Kelsey was barely involved. He saw just three 10 zone targets last year. You need a guy who can make things happen down there. And I think Watkins is going to be that possession receiver guy down by the end zone. And the Chiefs threw the ball in the red zone on 61% of their plays last year, fifth highest percentage in the NFL. A team that throws the ball a lot in the red zone, plus a receiver that is very, very good at that part of the field. So he's a deep threat with high end speed, weight adjusted speed score, will play the X receiver position, but will also move around into the slot and get deep balls thrown his way. A very strong handed red zone receiver that is now in an offense that throws the ball in the red zone a lot. This is the year Watkins pulls it together, really busts out and proves to be the Chiefs number one weapon for fantasy purposes. Before we get into number two, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video, FantasyJokes.com. Actually, before we do that, if you're enjoying the video, if you liked what I just said about my man Sammy, scroll down and give this video a thumbs up, man. And if you haven't already, drop what your bold prediction is for the 2018 fantasy football season. Like I said, man, I ain't just dropping random ass now uh, pieces of, uh, of predictions out here. I'm hitting you with the stats and why I believe these will actually come true. Anyways, yeah, hit that thumbs up button down there, please. Let me know that you're enjoying these videos. FantasyJocks.com, the industry leader in anything your fantasy league needs for the 2018 season. Whether it's baseball, football, basketball, NASCAR, it don't really matter. They got everything. They have championship belts. They have championship rings. They have championship trophies. You can get your league champion engraved each year on that golden plaque. It's beautiful. These are great, great quality. I've had this one for about four years now. This is my big money league's belt. If you use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp. T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, you will get 10% off your purchase. It's really not that difficult. If you guys play in a $100 buy-in league, have everyone throw in $108 instead. An extra eight bucks will get you a trophy or a belt or a ring with a 10% off code. You can get your live draft board. That's the one we use in my E-Town Get Down Draft every single year. So if you watch those vlogs, you'll see they're really high quality, really good stuff. Fantasy Jocks, they won the award per the FSTA, Fantasy Sports Trade Association, the number one championship belt in the industry. These things are legit, man. I'm telling you, high quality. Go check them out, fantasyjocks.com. Thank you for sponsoring today's video. Bold prediction number two. You know I had to have my man's Anthony Miller 
on this list. Anthony Miller scores eight or more touchdowns on his way to being Chicago's number one fantasy wide receiver in PPR league and fantasy's wide receiver, rookie wide receiver one in 2018. I've talked endlessly about my love for Anthony Miller this offseason. He's all over my, my draft guide, which if you haven't purchased yet, if you haven't purchased yet, I would highly recommend doing so. BigDogsFantasy.com has got my top 250 overall rankings, positional rankings by tier, my top busts, my top sleepers, my must-draft players, along with a bunch of exclusive articles and videos throughout, updated weekly. You can get it on your mobile, can get it on your laptop, can get it on your tablet. Everything is interactive there are videos there are clickable links the top resources for your fantasy football season websites podcasts all this kind of stuff so check out my 2018 big dogs gotta eat fantasy football draft guide you don't need to go anywhere else for it what was i saying before i plugged that oh anthony miller's all over my draft guide so um he's my dynasty wide receiver one and uh i like I, I don't just talk about it. I literally traded one of my next year's first round picks along with probably something else for Anthony Miller in one of my dynasty drafts. And I'm pumped up about it. I needed to own at least one or two shares of him. And I've been touting him all summer. And now the training camp reports are booming about Miller, unsurprisingly. According to ESPN Bears reporter Jeff Dickerson, second round... Second rounder, Anthony Miller, is earmarked for the slot receiver job. That was never a concern in my mind. I knew he was going to be the slot receiver there. The question for me becomes, how long until Miller earns the starting spot as the wide receiver two on the outside ahead of Taylor Gabriel? I also don't expect that to take long. Here, here's a good thing to consider, even if he does play most of his snaps from the slot. I was looking at Warren Sharp's 2018 football preview, a book I highly recommend you guys cop if you're into football. If you want to learn more about the 2018 season, this guy is incredible. Um, I have no affiliation with this, but I will link it down below if you want to check it out on Amazon. Last year, the Chiefs ran three wide receiver personnel on just 53% of their plays. And remember, Matt Nagy is the new uh, head coach in Kansas City. He was the offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. They ran 53% of their plays out of three wide receiver personnel. Once Nagy took over play calling duties, Andy Reid gave him play calling duties like halfway through the year. That number jumped up a full 10%. Instead of 53%, they were now running three wide receiver personnel on 63%, which is huge for Miller, who's playing the slot. Um, and I really think he's going to end up starting in two wide receiver sets pretty pretty soon. So the Bears traded up to get this guy, right? You have a guy like Matt Nagy, who's a great offensive mind, comes over, handpicks him, makes sure they, that the Bears trade up to grab him in the second round. So high, high draft capital. And this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to jump into film school with Nicholas. We're going to look at some film, Anthony Miller. This is uh, just one game film that they have on the bottom of playerprofiler.com, but we're going to run through. We're going to run through a few different routes. And if you see on the bottom of the screen here, that little yellow arrow, um, you're going to see Anthony Miller highlighted there. What I want you to see is look at his route. Watch his route on this play. Look at the double move over the middle. Ferguson. The double move Miller swims to get over the defender. I wonder if I mute this if you could still – oh, yeah, you can still hear me. Cool. So the next route, all right, you see him on the bottom here, the bottom of the screen. Look at this double route he runs. He doesn't end up getting the pass thrown to him, but watch the route on the bottom of the screen. Whoop! Swim move over the defender. Oh, he was wide open for a deep touchdown there. We're going to move down to next play. Okay. Watch this catch by Miller. He keeps the QB alive. Boom, let me just snag in a little one-hander real quick. Let me show a little OBJ action for you. Come on, replay it, baby. Replay it for your mans. Watch this. So you're seeing extreme athletic ability. Whoop. So the first two plays I showed you were great route running moves. This is a nice little one-handed catch. The next play, I believe, is, let's see, he gets a screen play. Another way they can use him. Look at that stiff arm. So he's a smaller guy, right? But we've seen plenty of smaller guys act play tough in the NFL. And that was just like that was just me kind of showing the toughness that this guy has. He doesn't care about his size. He's someone who plays with a chip on his shoulder, not afraid to get physical. Stiff arm right to that guy's face. Watch this play. They're on the 20-yard line. He's at the top of the screen there. Watch this double move on this guy. Whoop. Great route. They'll reshow it. Strong, strong hands in the end zone. Contested catch rate is phenomenal. I think they're going to replay it. Watch this move. Whoop. This guy's routes are crispy. He's a little older, and that's why his routes are so nice. 
But look at the contested catch. Strong hands while the defender's hand is through him. Um, and, and just, you know, just a great play by him. Miller just using his hand. You'll notice that every every play he makes, he catches the ball with his hands. Let's see. I think this is a play watching him with the ball in his hands. Another screenplay for him. They love to get him in space. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So I'm basically I'm breaking this down to show you how how he really doesn't have too many flaws. He has great routes. He's great at catching the ball in contested areas. He's great at moving with the ball in his hands after he catches it. This next play is going to be the best play on here, bar none. If this doesn't sell you on him, uh, I don't know what will. If this isn't, if think of Antonio Brown when you're watching this play. They're inside the 10-yard line where the defense is super tight. You need to have really strong hands to make this play. Just watch this. Oh, the route is beautiful. Boom. If that that we've seen Antonio Brown make touchdown catches just like that so many times. Watch this replay on this. Strong hands and tight space. I want them to show the double route again. Oh, they don't show. I'm going to go back for you. Don't you worry. Watch this route on the top there. There are not many uh, wide receivers that can make that nice of a move in tight space. And that is why I think he's just an absolute playmaker. And he's going to get the ball in that space, man. Even when you're that small, if you could run routes like that, the quarterbacks are going to fall in love with you and they're going to feed you. Um, last play on here I think I wanted to show you was just another, you know, Anthony Miller catching the ball in contested space uh, for, for a touchdown, of course. I think that's really it. I think that's all all we had for you. Just another incredibly tough contested catch in the end zone for a TD by Millar. Look at that. That's like Calvin Johnson-esque. I just love how he is able to make all these contested catches, and he plays so much bigger than his size, and his routes are so smooth, man. He just plays with a chip on his shoulder, and I absolutely love that about Anthony Miller. All right, so I hope you enjoyed a little bit of film school with me. I think I might do that throughout the season. If I get the NFL Game Pass, I might go back and look at some film throughout the week of the actual NFL games and kind of break them down for you. But uh, Miller was absolutely prolific in terms of producing in college. 191 catches. 2,896 yards and 32 touchdowns over his final two seasons at Memphis. 32 touchdowns over those last two years. 32. The guy's just a playmaker and he knows how to get in the end zone. That's really what it comes down to. It doesn't matter who he's playing against. He just gets there. He's going to get the job done. And of course, when you're playing for a school like Memphis, there's always going to be that natural bias to say, oh, he didn't play against a top competition. He wasn't in the SEC. How do we know if he's really any good if he could play against NFL competition? But I wanted to look back and I wanted to see, you know, like obviously Memphis plays a lesser schedule, but did they play any worthwhile opponents that we can kind of go off of? And I looked back and they play UCF, Central Florida. Yes, the real, the only national champion we acknowledge here at Big Dogs Gotta Eat. They played against Central Florida last year. Yes, when they went 13-0. Memphis did lose that game, but they were on the road. Miller put up 14 catches, 195 yards, three touchdowns versus Central Florida. He also played them last year in 2016. 10 catches, 153 yards, one touchdown. Um, and they played some other good opponents as well. They played at Houston on the road. Miller went 10 for 178. Against UCLA, 9 for 195 and two touchdowns. In 2016, they played Houston also, who was a good team that year. Miller went 15 for 169, two touchdowns. Against Old Miss, 10 for 132. I know Ole Miss was not the team that they've been over the previous years, but 10 for 132 against an SEC defense is still something that you should, you know, acknowledge. Um, against the 10 and 3 Tulsa team, 12 for 250 and two touchdowns. You get the point. They do play weaker opponents overall, but in any game that they played a semblance of a, of a good team, Miller absolutely destroyed them. Um, and, and now you look at the Bears, right? You look at this team. Trubisky is a guy who loves to throw the ball over the middle of the field and is much better at doing so. You know, uh, Warren Sharp does an amazing job of breaking down just how good Trubisky is at throwing the ball over the field, in the middle of the field. I think, oh, I have it in here. Cool. So, but even dating back to college, right? That year, the one year at UNC when Trubisky was an actual like starter, guess who he leaned on? It was Ryan Switzer, who is now an NFL slot receiver, 5'8", 181 pounds. Miller is more, more size than that. But in that year at UNC, 
Switzer caught 96 passes for 1,112 yards with Trubisky throwing on the ball. He loves throwing over the middle of the field. Looking at last year too, Kendall Wright saw the high majority of targets when Trubisky was the uh, the quarterback for the Bears in, in his 12-game sample size. So, per Warren Sharp's preview, quote-unquote, on all downs when targeting the middle of the field, Trubisky's 105 QB rating ranked 7th among 32 quarterbacks. His success rate ranked 2nd in the NFL. On early downs only, which is a good sample that Warren Sharp I love uses because those are unbiased. It doesn't mean that it's like long 3rd and 12 or 3rd and 1, so none of the plays are biased. On early downs only, Trubisky's 114 rating ranked 3rd with a league best 69% nice percent success rate. Amazing throwing the ball over the middle, we'll put it that way, really poor outside. The best part about this whole Bears offense is how they revamped it, right? They bring in Allen Robinson, they bring in Trey Burton, they bring in Taylor Gabriel, they have Tariq Cohen. No one has a leg up on anyone else when it comes to being on the quarterback's good side, being on the coach's good side. They're all coming into this new scheme, philosophy, and personnel. So if they can gain quick connection with Trubisky, they're going to get the leg up, and I think Miller has that. And Miller is going to gain that quickly over the summer. Lastly, I just love Miller's story and the fact that he's going to be playing with a chip on his shoulder, right? He, you could see he's a playmaker. Uh, head coach Matt Nagy said he plays with some confidence. As coaches, we we said that when we drafted him. You saw the tape. You saw that he can make plays, and he plays with a little little bit of that swag, and you can never take that away. Um, you can never take that away from him. Uh, you just got to control it, and I, I, they're going to do a great job of doing that. When you have a guy like Tariq Hill that he worked with, has kind of that same swag, right, that chip on his shoulder swag, and I think they're going to be able to take that away from that and, and use it towards Anthony Miller. This is a quote from Miller. I came from nothing. I was a walk-on. Nobody offered me anything. Now I'm a second-round pick, and I'm out here with the Chicago Bears, one of the best organizations in the league, and I couldn't be more blessed to be here. So I'm going to have fun every chance I have to get out there. Man, there's nothing I don't like about Miller's game. He has some concentration drops every once in a while, but I'm not worried about that considering the playmaking ability he brings on the other end of the spectrum. Man, I just love Anthony Miller. I can't, I can't talk about him enough. It's actually out of control. I don't think I'm going to be wrong on Miller either. So we're going to move to Numero Trace. And this was actually one that I snagged from one of you guys on Twitter. I'm not even sure who it was, to be honest with you. But I, I tweeted out, I was like, what are, you, what, is, what are some of your guys' bold predictions for the 2018 fantasy football season? One of you guys said, CJ Anderson outscores Christian McCaffrey in 2018. And I am stealing that from you. I've been a big advocate of C.J. Anderson this year because of the role he's going to get, and I've been down on on uh, Christian McCaffrey, so that is my prediction. C.J. Anderson outscores Christian McCaffrey in half PPR 2018 fantasy football leagues. And I wanted to take a completely statistical and mathematical approach to see if this was even possible. So that's exactly what I did. Last year, I'm just going to read a lot from the screen because I have a lot of numbers on here. McCaffrey finished with 188 0.6 fantasy points in half point PPR, which is good for RB11 overall, RB13 points per game. CMAC gained 435 rushing yards on 117 carries, scored twice on the ground, 3.7 yards per carry, but he was obviously a great receiving back. He caught 80 of 106 targets for 651 yards, five scores. So overall, a little bit under 1,100 total yards and seven scores on just under 200 in touches. Under 200 touches, excuse me. So the questions we need to answer for McCaffrey are this, heading into 2018. Number one, will McCaffrey get more work in the running game? Number two, will he be more efficient in the running game? Number three, is his role in the passing game going to be the same? So we'll, we'll tackle number one. Will he get more work in the running game? He saw 117 carries last year, which obviously is not a lot of carries for a starting running back, um, which is arguably not even the starting running back really there. But... I feel like Carolina showed their cards last year. Well, I mean, and this offseason. For one, they gave Jonathan Stewart 198 carries to McCaffrey's 117 last year. If you wanted to get McCaffrey more involved in the running game, why wouldn't you have done that when Stewart was averaging 3.4 yards per carry last year? Why didn't you have more trust in McCaffrey? I don't understand. When Stewart was that bad, you still didn't want to give McCaffrey more work. That 3.4 yards per carry was the worst mark among all running backs that had 170 carries or more. There was 27 of them, and Stewart was the worst on a yards per carry basis. So sure, we could talk about 
McCaffrey putting on a whole five pounds this offseason, and that's going to bulk him up and make him run better between the tackles. But them going out and signing C.J. Anderson tells me that he's going to get stuck right into that Jonathan Stewart role um, and, and they're not really comfortable giving McCaffrey more carries. So will he get more work in the running game? Maybe a little bit more just because of natural progression, but I don't think it's going to be much more. Question number two, will he be more efficient in the running game? It, I mean, it would be difficult to say no, right? It would be difficult for him to be less efficient than he was last year after averaging 3.7 yards per carry. Well, I would have said I agree, and I would have said he would be more efficient, but they did not... They did not re-sign their all-pro left guard, Andrew Norwell, this summer. Shout out my man, Wade, for sending me this screenshot. I'm not even sure. You're going to have to uh, confirm with me where this actually came from. But I think it, was, it actually might have been from Warren Sharp. McCaffrey's running splits last year. Look at the numbers. They're all pretty poor except for the left guard. 5.48 yards per carry. Guess who is at left guard? Andrew Norwell, pro bowler. PFF's number three overall graded guard in the NFL last year. Now he's gone. Will McCaffrey see any success on the line now that Norwell, where he ranked five or where he where he ran for 5.48 yards per carry, is no longer there? Will this affect Christian McCaffrey's running efficiency? Yes. This will affect the entire team, the entire Panthers um, offensive game, because losing linemen we've seen over the last few years uh, can be devastating to to an offense overall. So I'm not so quick to pull the efficiency trigger on McCaffrey uh, considering that they lost Andrew Norwell. So question number three, is his role in the passing game going to be the same or improved? It should be the same, but I don't see any expectations for that increasing. I mean, his 106 targets last year led all NFL running backs, um, and 106 targets is a lot for the running back position. So what I wanted to do is take a look back at running backs that I've seen around this target number and what actually happened in the following year. So according to this chart, right, since 2007, that's as far back as pro football focus goes. So I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to go any farther back, but there have been five running backs that have seen a hundred or more targets in a season. And McCaffrey saw um, 106 last year. So as you can see, the results were not pretty in favor of seeing the same amount of volume in the next year. Now, I'm aware that this, this chart, you know, it absolutely has nothing to do with McCaffrey's outlook in 2018, and it holds no predictive value, but it's definitely interesting to see nonetheless, because you look at all the target numbers. Brian Westbrook's fell off dramatically. Darren Sproles's didn't fall off dramatically, but um, even dropping from 106 to 93 or 90 is going to impact his bottom line. Matt Forte's fell off. Le'Veon Bell got hurt, so that's why the numbers were so low. But in the six, he played six games, got 25 targets. That would pace out to 67 targets. Um, David Johnson got hurt after his big year. So there's not one actual instance in where the target number went up or even stayed within 10 targets of the next year. The other thing that concerns me, obviously, is the fact that they didn't really have any pass catchers going for them in Carolina. C-Max scored five uh, receiving touchdowns. Four of the five came in games where Greg Olson was not on the field. His his per game numbers in terms of receptions and targets dipped pretty badly when Olson was actually on the field. Right now they drafted DJ Moore in the first round, so they're going to be using him a ton. Uh, they traded for Torrey Smith. They signed Jarius Wright. Um, they get their first round pick Curtis Samuel back on the field as well as Greg Olson being heavy. So. There is a lot more weapons for Cam Newton to use in 2017 outside of just McCaffrey. So even if you think he sees an uptick in rushing volume, I think that passing volume is actually going to fall back. And like I said, this chart was not predictive what I was telling you, but what it might, you know, what it might say is that and this is just thinking outside the box. What it might say is that these numbers all dipped off cuz maybe those teams were like this, you know, there's only five of them that have seen this many targets in 10 years. So maybe those teams in the offseason were like we need to diversify the weapons and sign someone else in the offseason and that was the reason why um the targets dipped off in the next following year because they don't want to rely on just passing to the running back so heavily and that's what we saw carolina do they upgraded their passing core a lot this offseason so that's why i think like i think you know he's still going to be heavily involved but i think we're going to see that 106 target number probably drop to around 95 90 um if that and that's going to like i said be a huge hit on his bottom line so when i'm looking at it my realistic projection for McCaffrey in 2018 would be a, be about probably 500 rushing yards, um, which is an increase from last year, 72 receptions, 
and about 580 receiving yards, five touchdowns overall. I don't think he's going to hit seven touchdowns again because receiving uh, touchdowns for running backs are very fluctuating, and five is a very high number. So, I mean, I think that's that's really not unreasonable or unrealistic to think he has, again, about 1,100 total yards considering they're getting a lot more weapons back and five scores. So those numbers will put him at 170 fantasy points, half-point PPR. So what does it take for C.J. Anderson to actually beat that? We look at Stewart's role, and this is exactly where I see C.J. Anderson fitting in, taking over that exact role that Stewart had. Stewart's been a guy that's ranked inside the NFL's top eight in terms of carries inside the five-yard line. So he's always among the top NFL running backs in terms of goal line carries in this offense. Um, and that's for the last three years while he's been in Carolina. So he scored 21 rushing touchdowns over the last three years. And I think, one, Anderson gets all of that work. Two, Anderson will be more efficient than Stewart's 3.4 yards per carry overall. But I think he'll still see around the same amount of carries, right? Between 200 and 210 carries. I think that's realistic considering he's going to fit right into that role. The separator for me and where I think Anderson is actually going to be able to hit this mark is in the passing game. Um, Stewart caught just eight passes in each of the previous two seasons or 0.57 receptions a game. Anderson over the last four seasons with the Broncos has averaged two receptions per game and has never dipped below an 80% catch rate. So he catches the balls that are thrown his way, while Stewart's catch rate over the last two years has been an abysmal 62% and 50%. So I think this is a team that can trust Anderson to stay on the field more and catch passes more because, by statistically proven, he is a better pass catcher. So Anderson offers more upside and efficiency at all aspects, catching the ball and running the ball. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep Anderson at 210 carries, which is around what Stewart has been seeing. 210 carries. Um, and I'm going to put him at 4.1 yards per carry. I, I, that might, Maybe that's a reach, but again, this is bold prediction. So 4.1 yards per carry, 210 carries. I don't really know why I'm putting him at 4.1 yards, but I think it's kind of logical. That's going to equate to 861 rushing yards. And I'm going to be bold. And since I, you know, since I said there's so much opportunity for Stewart at the goal line, let's say CJ Anderson scores nine rushing touchdowns. That's what Stewart had in 2016. So I don't think it's absurd for CJ Anderson, given the goal line role there, for him to match that number that Stewart had. So I'm going to give him nine rushing touchdowns. That gives between 861 rushing yards and nine touchdowns, 140.1 half-point PPR fantasy points. So he just needs 34 more in the passing game to beat C-Max number. I'm going to give him one receiving touchdown, and I think that might be even lowballing it, to be honest with you, but Stewart has scored a receiving touchdown in three of the last four years, so I think it's reasonable to say C.J. Anderson gets one. Um, so he needs 28 more fantasy points going down the list. As I said, Anderson should be more uh, effective and ultimately more trusted by the coaching staff on the passing game. So uh, Stewart had eight receptions in each of the previous two years. I'm going to put C.J. Anderson at 20. I don't think that's not an outrageous number. I think C.J. Anderson catches 20 passes, um, so that would, in half-point PPR, that's 10 more fantasy points. That knocks him down to 18 fantasy points left. So you look at C.J. Anderson's career, 8.3 yards per reception. So how many yards is he going to gain off those 20 receptions? That would equate out 8.3 times 20, obviously. Would come out to 166.6 receiving yards or 16.6 fantasy points. That leaves us like a point and a half shy of C-Max, 174 points. I don't know, man. That's close enough. Um, with any luck, he'll find those two points somewhere else. Whatever. Maybe Cam Newton doesn't take in one of the goal line carries and C.J. Anderson scores double-digit touchdowns. This is bold prediction, so we're going to go with that. And that effectively, mathematically, statistically, logically speaking, puts C.J. Anderson ahead of C-Mac in the 2018 fantasy football season for bold prediction number three. What? What? Come at me. I feel like I, I backed all those up. I biked them up pretty damn well. So again, drop your bold predictions down below. I want to I wanna talk about some of my honorable mentions here. Um, I was going to put Carrion Johnson finishes at the number two fantasy rookie overall. Um, I, I guess it's not really that bold because a lot of people like Carrion, but behind Barkley, I mean, Geis is still really good. People like Rojo, people like Royce Freeman, people like um, Penny. So Carrion Johnson, number two fantasy rookie running back. Emmanuel Sanders will finish outright with more points than Demarius Thomas. Jameis Winston is the top three quarterback in fantasy points per game once he returns. My bonus, just NFL honorable mentions. Raiders finish with the worst record in the NFL in 2018. That's what I got for you out of the HQ today, baby. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure you give it that thumbs up. If you found it valuable, thumbs up. 
If you are new to the channel, subscribe. We're going to be coming out with good videos like this. We'll be hitting you with all the facts all the time for the rest of the summer into the season. Um, make sure you go cop my draft guide because it's just all in-depth stats just like this in every part of every article that I put in that bad boy. So, again, thank you for joining me if you stayed around this long. And I'll see y'all on Friday. Bye.